Okay. Okay, folks. So welcome to quantum field theory, the second portion of our two semester course dubbed principles of theoretical physics. I am very, very, very excited to be teaching this class. I think this is the one subject where uh, this is it. Like this is the this is the the real deal. This is the language that uh, we use on a daily basis. And I think getting you guys there is going to be a lot of fun. That being said, it's also going to be a lot of work. Uh, this subject has a notorious reputation for difficulty in the physics community. That reputation is well earned. It is a very <laughs> challenging subject to learn, both because it's conceptually abstract, it's very hard to wrap your head around, and also because it's very hard mathematically and calculationally. Uh, the tools that we use are very sophisticated. I mean, not to a mathematician, but, but they're still, they're very sophisticated mathematical tools. And so I've developed the, stru the structure of this course in a very particular way, because I want you guys to actually learn the subject. I don't want you to come here, watch me derive a bunch of stuff, and be totally confused because that's what happens to a lot of even graduate students. So the whole point is for you to learn quantum field theory and to be able to use it and to be able to understand it. And so we have structured the course in a very particular way, different from quantum mechanics uh, because quantum mechanics is very difficult, it's challenging, but there's a lot of sources out there. There's a lot of resources, there's a lot of videos. It's not as dense to get into. So I'm going to spend about 20 minutes going over logistics and kind of the structure. And then I have a little lecture for you to give you the flavor of the subject, give you the big picture idea of where we're going. And of course, we're going to introduce conventions and all of that kind of thing. Now, uh, as you know, my name is Kyle. I'll write it on the board for people that are new here or who will be watching you. I am a student at Columbia University. I'm graduating and uh, also this semester in the spring, I'm working at the University of Pennsylvania as a researcher. So a project that I'm working on this spring is a project called the double copy. So those of you that I think I've introduced you, Jenna, and someone else to this double copy, you'll be working with me and this professor at Penn. So uh, I want you guys this term to use my Penn email because it's totally empty. So this way I'll actually get your emails because I, I've been missing them lately. So here's my email for this term. Kyle SI at sas.upen. Edu. Just because my Columbia email is very, very crowded. So I don't want to miss your when when people write to me because usually it's it's more time sensitive. So uh, last semester, we had a TA named Gabe Matos. Uh, this semester, we'll have a different TA. Our TA this semester will be Johnson Jang. Uh, he's a student at the Cooper Union uh, in, in, in the city. And he's a, he's a very, uh, I'll put his email here too. Johnson J 99 at gmail.com. And the, the reason he's the TA, his, and he's gonna have a session after today. So he'll have the usual Saturday sessions. So his first session will be today. I highly, highly encourage you to go or stay because his sole purpose is to do two things. It's to teach you math, like actually teach you math, not just skip over all the steps and go over anything complicated in my lecture. So we're going to be doing a lot of very complicated integrals. We're gonna be doing a lot of very complicated derivations. I don't have the time to teach you all of the you know, formulas, okay? That's what he's gonna do. So he is like the best resource ever. No quantum field theory class has someone like this. He, I, I, I call him the math guy. 
So use him, ask him, like learn the math. That's very exciting that you have this chance so early in your careers to learn all this stuff. So that's what he's here for. And his sessions are, his first session is gonna to be today at 11, right after the lecture. And then he's gonna survey you guys and the guys asynchronously when the next session should be, or if you want a different day. Okay, so here's the structure of the course. Uh, there will be no homework problems, okay? However, there will be mandatory reading from the book, Quantum Field Theory for the Gifted Amateur. So QFT. So this is the mandatory text. And this is by Lancaster and Blundell. Okay, I had an epiphany. I will not be using a textbook for my notes. Okay, so I'm not following any book. I kind of just derive things how I want to do it and structure it in the way I want to do it. However, when I was writing my notes, I said, this is really, this is too much. This is hard. Uh, and so here's my saying. I say, whatever you put into something, that's what you get out of it, right? And we've all heard this. Uh, if you don't read the chapters I assigned from this book, I'm telling you now, you're going to be totally lost when you come here, okay? Full disclaimer on camera, you will be completely lost. And I, I, there's just no other way around it because the way I'm writing my notes, it's for people who are going to be doing research. It's for those people. That's okay, they're, they're hard. This book will get you there, okay? I have not read this book totally, so don't start asking me questions. I mean, I haven't really, someone recommended, okay, quantum field theory, all the books in the past were written by experts for experts, for like training experts. You guys will be experts in training, but not yet, you're not there yet uh, because you don't have the background. Uh, so someone said, look at this book. It was written by two experimenters who wanted to learn QFT and it shows, it's a beautiful book from what I've seen. They go through all the steps very slowly, very, now you need to know some quantum mechanics, which you all know, but they go through all the steps very methodically. This is like a, a, a treasure. I didn't even know this existed. And frankly, when I was taking the course, uh, I probably would have used it a lot. And I, I even probably would have gotten a lot out of it and learned things a lot faster and not have to have bang my head at the wall. Like, what is this guy doing? He skipped 10 steps. <laughs> He got the answer out of nowhere. So please use this book. I will assign reading out of it. You need to read it or you'll be lost. And it's just, it is what it is. There's gonna be a lot of reading. Uh, that's, that's the reality. Uh, and we're going to be moving really fast through this. So <laughs> just fair warning. Okay, that's that. I'm going to give you all my other, oh, what else? Oh yeah, no homework problems, right? Cause I want you to read instead of problem solving sessions, Johnson will do his math sessions. I have written up some problems from, from my notes, just made them up. Sunday morning, I usually do office hours, right? Instead, what I'm gonna do this time is Sunday for the first half hour, so nine to 9.30, I will solve a problem, okay? I will solve a problem. I think that will be very useful to see me actually do some problems, right? Because problems are how people learn physics. And then 9.30 to 10, I'll have my usual, if you have questions, whatever. Uh, I will not be doing a problem solving session tomorrow. I don't have a problem for tomorrow. However, I'll be here tomorrow morning at nine. Those of you who will watch on YouTube, those of you that are here, if you have questions about field theory, come tomorrow morning at nine. Uh, nine to 10, I'll be answering any questions. Okay, so this is the primary text. Uh, I sent a PDF. Did everyone get that? I hope you did. So you don't have to actually buy it. So yeah, so uh, someone sent me a scanned PDF. So that was nice of them. Okay, so let's go through other texts that we might want to look at. So as you can see, the structure of the course is a lot different than 
quantum mechanics. Uh, quantum mechanics is more standard. You had a, a problem set, you solved the problems, and you know, you left. But this is going to be different. Okay, that being said, you should also look at other sources, right? Because uh, you might get more insight. So the textbooks I'm going to show you are are harder at a higher level than Lancaster and Blundell. All of them are written by theorists, but uh, these are the books we would use in a graduate class. Uh, these books are more at the level of what I'll be teaching, uh, more or less. So I'll go from easiest to hardest. First book is Quantum Field Theory and the Standard Model by Matthew Schwartz. Uh, this was a book that has been highly recommended as a great book to start learning QFT. Very good book. I mean, I haven't used it much, but it's good. The next book is called Quantum Field Theory in a Nutshell by Z. You should all know this one because I've mentioned it. Read this, read this, read stuff out of this. This is like bedtime reading, okay? Because there's really, you won't learn too much calculation in this, but his writing is so awesome. And he's such a great physicist. So all of these have PDFs online, by the way. The third book is just called Quantum Field Theory by a guy named Strednicki. This is what we used in my quantum field theory class. It's a very good book. Uh, I'm not, I, there's some things I don't love about it. That's why I didn't use this for my lectures. I mean, uh, it's there, the chapters are very short, uh, which is good and bad because he skips a lot. So it's a good book, solid. And the last book, which is what you will use when you do research with me, this is where we get our derivations, is The Quantum Theory of Fields by Steven Weinberg, who's one of the greatest masters of field theory. Like, honestly, I would just even look at this in the index. I would just read some stuff in here, even though you might not get all of it because it's, it's hard. But this is my favorite book on the subject. I think this is the only book that actually to help really, really motivates quantum fields, like really from the beginning, why do we need fields? It's not always obvious. Now, of course, field theory is the study of elementary particles, right? That's, that's what we're trying to do. A lot of people use quantum field theory for other fields, statistical mechanics. You might use quantum field theory for condensed matter. Uh, I don't do any of that. I don't know any condensed matter. Uh, so uh, I do particle physics. So there's this great book, Concepts of Elementary Particle Physics by Peskin. This is good if you want to learn about experiments. And I learned a lot from this book. Another awesome book, especially for you guys who are just starting, it's a book called Introduction to Elementary Particles by David Griffiths. Uh, you might recognize the name because he wrote the famous quantum mechanics textbook. This particle physics textbook is awesome. Uh, any of you will understand it, really, just by reading it. I mean, it's very, it's not very complicated. Okay, and if you're really like, if you really want to torture yourself, you pick up this book, A Gauge Theory of Elementary Particle Physics by Cheng and Li. Uh, this is really a monograph. This is like what I use when I'm writing a paper and I need like a, a quick refresher. You won't learn anything from this book. It's like, uh... and if you want to learn group theory, which Johnson will be teaching some, like today, Johnson's going to go over Fourier transforms, right? Which you've heard, but you probably don't know what really they are. He's going to go over, uh, you know, stuff like that, basic stuff. I don't know what else, but uh, group theory in a nutshell by Anthony Z. This is like the best book ever on group theory. It's awesome. It's a big book. So group theory is a big, big subject in, in particle physics, so. Okay, folks, so that, that's the reading list. Uh, do find other sources. If you find other things, let me know. Like uh, there's so much stuff out there. This is just what I know uh, and what I've seen. So uh, it's a lot, but if you find something better, there's another book by Peskin and Schroeder, uh, which is very popular. I think it's totally outdated. I wouldn't even use it. And it's just a very hard book. And there's another book by Bjorken and Drell. It was written in 1960. So it's probably not a great book either. So, 
Okay, great. Okay, let's get started then. Let's begin our search, our exploration. So I, I like to tell people, I give them warning that the subject is difficult, which it is, but I also tell them it's probably the most beautiful subject you'll ever, ever learn. And if you really put in a lot of effort and you really try and learn it, you'll be very, very happy because it's just such a, first of all, it's a miracle that it works. Okay, that's the first thing. And when, when we start really getting into the nitty gritty, you're going to feel the same way. You're gonna be like, wow, how does this even work? Well, it does. Second of all, it gives us tremendous insight into nature. The most fundamental laws come from quantum field theory, okay? The fact that there are antiparticles comes from quantum field theory. The fact that two particles can decay into many particles comes from quantum field theory, right? Uh, predictions for the Higgs boson come from quantum field theory. I mean, a lot of things come from field theory. Uh, it is, in a sense, our most fundamental theory. However, as you'll see, it's not, it cannot be the total story uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, which hopefully we'll figure out as if, if you guys become physicists, we all go into physics, or as you continue to explore, you'll see why quantum field theory cannot be the final, the final uh, bookend on our exploration into the laws of nature. Now, we in this course have actually done a lot of work motivating quantum field theory. I kind of forgot, even though it's been three weeks, I will, if, if those of you who didn't, please go on YouTube and watch our lecture, The Conceptual Basis of Quantum Field Theory. You may remember, we motivated a lot of quantum field theory. I'm, I'm impressed actually by how much we got done last, last term. So let's have a refresher. What did we motivate? First of all, we motivated the idea of Lorentz invariance, right? We first said that what is quantum field theory? First and foremost, it's a combination of special relativity and quantum mechanics, right? It's taking our high energy, uh, high energy scales and developing a theory that's consistent with that. And we explored the idea of Lorentz invariance. We said, well, if we want to have equations that dictate how the fields behave, we need them to be Lorentz invariant, right? That is something we demand. And what did we derive? We derived the Klein-Gordon equation, right? Uh, and we said it was Lorentz invariant, and we proved that using Lorentz transformations. We also showed that the Klein-Gordon equation had some weirdness to it, uh, that it, uh, it had negative uh, energy states, right? Which we'll talk about more as we move along and that it had negative probabilities. So it had some weirdness to it. So we've motivated quantum field theory. We derive commutation relations for the fields. And we also, uh, we also started this talking about this idea of raising and lowering operators from the harmonic oscillator, transforming them now into creation and annihilation operators on some vacuum state that correspond to the creation and destruction of particles. So we, we've kind of talked a lot about certain things, and now we're going to get into much more detail with all of that. This first lecture, however, I want to give you a very broad overview. I'm going to, so the way I I've structured this is, I find a lot of times people get lost in the details. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by giving you a really broad invitation to where we're going. Now that means you're not gonna understand everything. I'm, I'm getting, you're gonna be a little, where did he get that? That's okay. That's okay because you're going to, I'm going to show you all of that. Uh, I just want you to get the conceptual ideas, right? Uh, okay, so let's get going. And the conceptual idea we're gonna look at today is a particle physics process. We are going to look at the process of an electron and positron colliding, annihilating each other and becoming two muons. And this is a process we see a lot. It's a very well-studied process of quantum electrodynamics. Now, before we do that, let me give you your homework. Now we're gonna have readings, so. So the reading, the homework for this week will be Lancaster Blundell. Uh, I have it written down. It will be chapter zero, one. They're, they're short chapters, so don't worry. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 
11, 12, and Appendix B. They're very short chapters. And the reading will be a lot less in later weeks, don't worry. It's just this first week, there's a lot of refreshers too. Okay, so that's the homework. And uh, the second part of your homework will be to watch on YouTube, watch the lecture titled Quantum. Field theory. In a nutshell. And guess who's giving this lecture? Tony Z. So he just gave a lecture on on and it's with the Cambridge physics student group. I don't even know. So Tony Z just gave a lecture on YouTube two two months ago titled Quantum Field Theory in a Nutshell. Guess what? There's no math. You could be in middle school and understand this lecture. Yes. What does he do? He takes you through the history of the subject. And, and honestly, to me, I really think knowing the history of physics is very important. And I think not enough students know the history of physics. What have people discovered? What, what was the development? I would recommend everyone watch this. And definitely you guys should watch it because you'll gain such an appreciation for it, the subject. And then when we derive certain things, we'll be like, wow, now I actually learned what they did. So it's like an hour and a half, like, you know, tomorrow morning, it's a week weekend, watch it. I watched it, I was very, very uh, uh, happy with it. I mean, it was just so enjoyable to listen to. And Anthony Z is just awesome. I mean, you'll see, he's very, 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 uh, he's like an expert of the history of the subject. Not only is he a great physicist, but he knows what has come before. So please watch this too on YouTube. Let me know if you can't find it. Uh, it's very new, but uh, okay. So this is the homework. Appendix B is on complex analysis. So to help you with contour integrals. Okay, any questions before we get into working out some stuff? Okay, okay, let's begin. So it is a lot of reading this week, but uh, it's okay. It's the first week. We, I want to get you all up to speed. Okay. Kyle, the name of the, uh, of the LV text is again. Uh, quantum field theory for the gifted amateur. Oh, okay. I, I did email a PDF, Bob, so yeah. Okay, great. And gifted is a very loose word. <laughs> uh, it means you know quantum mechanics really well. <laughs> so, okay. Okay, before we begin, I wanna sort of set down some of our conventions, right? Like some of our mathematical conventions. The first one, H bar equals C equals one. Woohoo, God units. Uh, uh, if you're really curious as to why we can do this, go look it up. Uh, Every particle physicist in the world does this, and you'll see why. We don't keep track of the factors. Okay, we have our definition for the Minkowski metric. Instead of calling it eta mu nu, in QFT, particle physicists just call it g mu nu. Okay, so this is our Minkowski metric. g mu nu equals g mu nu upper. Uh, okay, now I've always showed you the signature of the metric with time being negative, right? Uh, most particle physicists do it the other way around. So we are also going to do it the other way around. So time will be positive and space will be negative. So this is just our standard Minkowski metric. Right, from special relativity, nothing crazy. If you have questions, please stop me. Uh, we don't have to go that fast. We have our position time four vector, also from special relativity. Right. If I want to lower the index or take the inverse, I can lower the index by using the metric. And that changes the sign of the spatial components. Right. Gabe showed you this one time, right? He showed you how lowering the index with the metric changes the sign. The relativistic dot product, P dot X, 
If I have two four vectors p dot x, well then the dot product is just g mu mu p mu x mu equals p zero x zero minus because I have the metric with me that uh, puts a minus sign on the spatial components, the spatial components of p dotted with the spatial components of x. So that's just our dot product in relativity, right? We bring the metric with us. Okay, I have the relativistic four vector p, so p squared equals p mu p mu equals e minus p squared equals m squared, sorry, e squared minus p squared, right? This is just the dot product of our energy momentum four vector, right? Which has energy in the time component and the spatial components in the other three spots. So this is just review. Our space-time derivative d mu is defined as this guy. So this is d dx mu, which is equal to d dt. Nabla, so this is our space-time derivative, right? Just a partial derivative in four directions. Any questions? Okay. Okay, I have my totally anti-symmetric tensor, epsilon mu nu rho sigma. This is the four index analog of, remember we had the Levy-Civetta tensor for cross products and angular momentum epsilon ijk. This is just the four index analog, which we'll be using. Uh, people define the conventions of this in a lot of ways. Our convention is that epsilon zero, one, two, three equals plus one. So it's the same idea. Remember we had different uh, permutations and that it was zero minus one or plus one. So just look up the four index, totally anti-symmetric tensor. Look up some of the properties of this guy. You'll be very thankful that you did. The reason we need the extra, extra index is that we're working now in space time, right? So we don't use the three, three index tensor, we use the four index tensor. This is all clear, right? This stuff down here and all of this stuff. This is just from special relativity. We're all okay with that? Okay, let's continue then. Let's, let's just write down some more of our conventions. We know from quantum mechanics, right? E equals I dx zero equals I d dt. That's our energy operator, right? E hat, right? And we also know that P in quantum mechanics equals minus I uh, nabla, right? Equals minus I del del x. Y. We'll see. Of course, in normal quantum mechanics, we usually have minus I over H bar, right? But now H bar is one. So get used to like seeing things without H bars. Any questions? Okay. We also know from quantum mechanics, and we also remember from quantum mechanics, our Pauli spin matrices. So sigma one, is one zero zero one sigma two is zero minus i i zero sigma three is minus one zero zero one right those are our Pauli spin matrices oh sorry one zero zero minus one I always mess them up Right, and then we have some nice identities that we like to use with them. Sigma i sigma j equals delta i j plus i epsilon i j k sigma k, where delta i j is our Kronecker delta, sigma k, uh, epsilon i j k is our normal levi trivetta tensor. A lot of times what we like to do is we like to take linear combinations of the uh, spin matrices, which we know. So we define sigma plus minus as a, a linear combination of some of our spin matrices. So that's one half sigma one plus or minus i sigma two. If you work this out, then you get two separate uh, linear combinations. You get sigma plus 
right? And it's defined as this matrix. And you get sigma minus. It's defined as this matrix. And these will correspond to spin up or spin down particles. Okay, so these are just a few little, little uh, refreshers. We've seen all of this before, kind of how to work with Pauli spin matrices. Good, everyone's okay. Okay, can I continue? Okay. If I'm going too fast, just let me know. I, I can slow down. Just with this stuff might be review. We have our uh, we we have this function that we're gonna use often. Theta of x, this is our heavy side step function, right? Which you've all probably seen. This is defined in the following way. It's equal to zero when x is less than one. It's equal to one when x is greater than one. So this is something we'll be using often, the step function. Another function we will be using a lot is the direct delta function, which you've used a lot in quantum mechanics, right? You've taken integrals of it, we've seen. And the direct delta function is literally Delta of x is just the derivative of the step function. Okay. That's the more precise definition, but we all love the direct delta function, right? It's our favorite function. Okay, and we have the very important identity that, uh, not identity, but uh, idea that the integral of the direct delta function in any arbitrary number of dimensions is just equal to one, right? Of course, this direct delta function is localized to one point, right? But if there were, if this was like x minus x1, then when would this integral be equal to one? When x and x1 were equal to each other, right? Because that means it's localized at one point. Okay, any questions? This should all be pretty basic, comfortable, nothing, nothing very hard right now. Okay, let's define our Fourier transforms. So going from position to momentum, and this is great because Johnson's going to literally tell you everything about this. So if you've never seen this, it's okay. So we have F of X in position space equal to the integral D four K pi to the fourth, right? K is a momentum integral, right? E to the minus I K dot X, uh, F tilde of K. Right, and we have that F tilde of K, just taking the Fourier transform, is equal to the integral DX e to the i k dot x f of x. All right, so these are familiar from quantum mechanics, right? Our Fourier transforms. Okay, and we also have the familiar result that this integral d four x e to the i k dot x uh, of the Dirac delta function d four of x equals. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry that this integral is equal to two pi, to, it's normalized to two pi to the fourth d4 of x. Or wait, am I in position space here? Sorry, this should be a k. I get a momentum delta function. Okay, these are from just from quantum mechanics, right? Fourier transforms take me from one basis to the other. I can always transform between them, right? Depending on what I want to look at. And then this is our normalization for just a free particle. We always get a direct delta function back out, localized at a point with some momentum k. Okay, any questions? That's our sort of crash course <laughs> through quantum mechanics. Not really quantum mechanics, but just some conventions that we're going to be using or that we need. Good? Okay, let's begin our first quantum field theory exploration, which is now what everyone will be entertained by. Okay. So we are going to look at this process. We're going to look at the process 
e plus e minus goes to mu plus mu minus, okay? Can someone tell me what is the charge of the electron? Is it negatively charged or positively charged? My chemistry people, come on. Ajay, is the electron negatively charged or positively charged? Negative. Thank you, thank you. Okay, we're away, we're away. That, that's good. So you might say, what the heck is E plus? That's weird. A positively charged electron? Yes that will be the electron's antiparticle called the positron. So actually quantum field theory predicts antiparticles, particles with, neg with the opposite charges that are the same mass of the original particle. This is crazy, you know, no one thought this was real and then we started seeing them. So similarly, the muon, mu, is usually negatively charged. So this is the anti-muon, that's the name. Very creative, I know. Uh, with the with a positive charge. Okay, so let's kind of draw out the kinematics of, of what's going on. Okay. So you have some electron flying in. And you know, we pick some basis, right? I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. You have some positron coming in too, right? Some magic happens, bam, 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 they crash, right? And what comes flying off? You have some mu minus flying off and some mu plus flying off at some angle theta. That's the kinematics. I, I drew you a little free body diagram of the kinematics of the problem. And you know, we're working in some frame, right? So we're working in center of mass frame, X and Z, right? That's our little basis. Okay, now what have we done in quantum mechanics? What is the main goal? of like, what can people even calculate, right? What is our ultimate goal as theorists? We wanna calculate something very important. And we were introduced to this in quantum mechanics. We wanna calculate the differential cross-section. What is a differential cross-section? The differential cross-section will tell the experimenter how many muons are in a particular region, how many electrons are in a particular region, all of the different qualities of the scattering procedure will be in the differential cross section, uh, which we'll go into more detail. What is that quantity? That's d sigma over d omega, right? Which we've seen in quantum mechanics, okay? How do we get d sigma over d omega, the differential cross section? Well, it's equal to some crazy factors. So it's equal to one over 64 pi squared e squared, the energy. This is like just a match with experiment. We'll see where we get all these random numbers. Times the script m squared, huh? What is this script m? So this is the name of the game here, the script m. Okay. I think Griffiths has a very nice explanation as well. You know, all the books do, so. What did we compute in non-relativistic quantum mechanics that sort of was the analog of this? Well, we computed something called f of theta, right? That was the thing we computed. So what is this and this? These are called scattering amplitudes, right? And the scattering amplitude tells us the probability of a certain process occurring, right? And tells us the physics of that process, right? Now we know from non-relativistic quantum mechanics, what happens? Well, you have the process that is most likely to occur, right? That's the first order process. But then this is quantum mechanics. So that process is just the most likely process. There are other processes that could occur. So maybe this happens, maybe that those are less likely, but you have to take them into account. So what did we end up getting? We ended up getting a perturbation series, right? And that was called the Born series, right? And we had different diagrams describing the different interactions, non-relativistically. And from that, we got Green's functions and all of these kinds of things. And we did this all non-relativistically, okay? So we, now the relativistic amplitude is the script M, okay? And 
This is what we need to compute for this process. Now Feynman knew of the Born series, so he just took it to relativistic territory. Okay. So let's try and do that really, really hand wavy. Let's not even consider anything relativistic. Let's just use some logic and see if we can get an amplitude. Okay. And some knowledge of the particles. Okay. Okay. So eventually what's going to happen is we are going to take our interactions, right, that we're talking about, and we're going to develop a pictorial representation of them, right, called the Feynman diagram, which we know. And each piece of the Feynman diagram is going to correspond to a piece of the amplitude, right? That's where we're headed. Now, Julian Schwinger, who you all know, I mentioned him, said Feynman brought quantum field theory to the masses. And he even said that many professors of physics are professors of calculating Feynman diagrams, which is true. You actually know nothing about the physics by getting an amplitude from a Feynman diagram, right? It's just turn the crank. We will derive the rules and that will teach you a lot about the physics and help you do other calculations. So. But I want you to see the process, but we're not even gonna introduce the Feynman rules yet. Let's just see if we can get an amplitude by sheer logic. Okay, so again, d sigma d omega is one over 64 pi squared e squared mu squared, where mu is our scatter, uh, m, I call it mu, it's m, sorry, is our scattering amplitude. And we draw a little diagram. So I have a diagram. I'm going to tell you what all this stuff means. I have the electron, the positron going in. I have the mu plus and the mu minus coming out. Okay. What the heck is going on in between here? Let's talk about that. So I have my electron going in. I have my positron going in. I have my mu plus going out and my anti muon going out. Sorry, my mu minus. I should switch these mu minus and plus so they match. The charge is labeled by these lines. These are called external lines. The charge for my electron is just what we would expect. The charge is going inbound from the electron. The electron has momentum, let's call it P, okay? Has some momentum. The positron, the antiparticle, we will see has a charge going in the opposite direction. In other words, the charge will be the opposite of the electron, right? Because it's the positron, it has a positive charge. So it's gonna have an outward charge. You will see what that means physically. And let's call its momentum P prime. So these guys collide and have some interaction here, right? At this point, we call this the vertex. When they collide, they actually exchange a particle, okay? In other words, it's not as if they collide and automatically you get muons. They collide and they exchange a particle. There's some other particle there that carries the force into the muons we know that this is a photon, right, called gamma. Okay. Its momentum is going this way, right, because it's going to go, uh, give momentum to the muons. It has a momentum, we'll call it Q. We always call internal momentums Q, and it's equal to K prime plus K equals P prime plus P, where K and K prime are going to be the momentum of the muons. Now this line, for the photon, the force carrying particle is an internal line, right? An internal line will always correspond to force carrying particles. Now, we call force carrying particles virtual particles because we never actually see them, which I've explained to you guys. We just deduce that they're there because of the way the interaction works. So again, the mu minus is going out and we'll say it has momentum k. The mu plus is also going out, but the anti-muon's charge will be in the opposite direction, which we'll see. And it has momentum k prime. 
So that labels our Feynman diagram. Any questions? Okay. So let's just guess an amplitude. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're going to be like, where did he get any of this? You're right, because you don't know where I'm getting any of this yet. Uh, you'll see. But let's use some ar heuristic arguments from quantum mechanics. What does heuristic mean? It means logical. Let's just use some logical deduction. Okay. So if, if we had a normal scattering process in perturbation theory and quantum mechanics, what would we want to calculate? That's the question. We would want to calculate some transition amplitude, right? And we would have an in state, something would go in. We would have an interaction Hamiltonian, right? That tells me about the interaction. Then we'd have an out state. That's what we do, okay? So let's try that. So we have a final state in our broadcast notation. We have an interaction Hamiltonian H sub I, and then we have an initial, and then we have a, a initial state. You know, Feynman used to say reading Brockett notations like reading Hebrew, you have to read from right to left, which is true. Something starts, goes, and exits. Okay, so let's translate this thing that we do in quantum mechanics, right? Perturbation theory, amplitude for interactions into field theory or what we are seeing here. Not field theory, but just what we're seeing here. Our final state is what? Mu plus, mu minus. Okay, then there's some interaction here at this point defined by the interaction Hamiltonian. Okay, then there is the photon, which is mediating the interaction. I'll tell you why I label this with a mu in a second. Then we have the photon. Then we have the interaction Hamiltonian. And then we end up with my electron positron pair. Okay, there we go. The mu's, I label them with mu because they're going to have to have some kind of spin configuration that will label in a four vector with some numbers because the muon and the electron are all spin one half. Spin one half particles are called fermions. They're all fermions. So that's why I put some mu's there so we can label them with some spin values. Okay, this looks fine. Now we, we, we don't really know how to compute any of this, which is okay, but let's just guess some stuff, okay? And let's see what we get as a result. First thing is, let's talk about the interaction Hamiltonian. Actually, before we do that, now that we've set up the problem, let's take a five minute break, 1025, okay? Four minute break. I'll erase this diagram and I will write this back up here. So we're trying to compute this guy. Not too bad so far, right? Are we okay? Okay, good. Ajay, what's your favorite particle? <laughs> I don't have a favorite. What a shame, what a shame. That's my goal by the end of this class to have you have a favorite particle. Have you decided on a favorite particle, Kyle? Oh man, Bob, you had to flip it. You had to flip it on me, right? <laughs> uh, I don't have one. I'm, I'm, I'm also. I'm, I'm democratic. 
probably most important particle that we've discovered recently is the Higgs boson, right? But even now, it's almost been, it's been 10 years since that discovery. Unbelievable. It feels like yesterday when I learned that it was discovered. It's been 10 years. <clears throat> Had modern physicists um, <clears throat> decided one way or the other whether they are still finer or smaller or subparticles than what they? Well, well, you know that's the that's the question. What is what is a more fundamental theory, right? I think quarks is where we've stopped. I don't know. I think strings. Some people are trying to get rid of fields altogether. So if you watch Z's video, you'll see this actually happened. There were many problems with QFT and uh, people tried to just get rid of field theory. Schwinger was one of them. He came up with a totally new approach because it wasn't working. Then once the kinks were worked out, then field theory really worked, but there, it happens. And I think in every, the development of every field. So I think right now we're actually not at the stage where people are saying there are new particles per se or smaller particles. We're at the stage where people are trying to come up with just completely different fundamental theories. We're just at a totally different place right now. Okay, let's continue. So of course, let's look at this piece first. Oh, let's look at this piece first. First thing is let's talk about the interaction Hamiltonian. So the interaction Hamiltonian is gonna tell me something about the strength of the interaction at those two points, right, where it's happening. Since this is electromagnetism or quantum electrodynamics, I would say that the interaction Hamiltonian needs to be proportional to the electric charge, right? Because I mean, that's just my crude guess. So we'll just say that HI, proportional to E. Now let's look at this piece first. Gamma HI E plus E minus mu. Now in this process, we have the particles colliding. And they have spins. Right, they have spins. Now, they could have a variety of different spin uh, configurations, right? Maybe the part of, maybe one particle is spin up, one spin down. They could have a variety of configurations and each one of those configurations is going to contribute to the amplitude, right? Because each spin configuration has a different probability of occurring. So now I need to find a way, let's try and uh, input one spin configuration, just one. So let's talk about this. So we have particles and antiparticles. Let's try and make up a spin configuration. Let's say all of the particle spins are parallel to their direction of motion. So in other words, if this electron, which is the particles moving in this direction, well, its spin is in the same direction, okay? And let's say all of the antiparticle spins are going counter, counter to their direction. You know, and, and in that language, we'll say that the particle spins are right-handed. This is important particle physics language. Right-handed spin means it's parallel to the direction. Left-handed spin means it's in the opposite direction, okay? So let's say that the electron and the muon have right-handed spin in this particular configuration, totally arbitrary. 
let's say the anti-muon and the positron, the antiparticles, have left-handed spin. So that means we're going to have some kind of amplitude where we have a right-handed and a left-handed particle, electron, positron, going to another right-handed and left-handed particle. And this is just one contribution to the full amplitude, right? Because there could be a different configuration. So we already said that this guy is going to be proportional to E, electric charge. What about this guy? I want to encode the spin. So I'm going to use some four vector and we're going to call it epsilon mu. Okay, epsilon mu is going to tell me about the spin. It's just a four vector. It's, and in, in our language, when we say an electron or muon is spinning in a particular direction, we use the word polarized. Okay. That's our definition for spin. We don't say it's spinning. We say it's polarized in this direction or the other. And you've probably heard the word polarization, those of you that have taken a physics class. So for the electrons, we're going to have a four vector. We're going to need what? We're going to need two non-zero numbers, right? Right, because the electrons are going in, we have two electrons coming in two different directions. So just intuitively, we already know that we need two. So we'll have a zero, right? This guy will correspond to no spin because it's just uh, in the T direction. Then we have, I'll, I'll put a one, you'll, you'll, you'll see why later on, an I and a zero. And you're probably like, where did he get this? Well, you'll see where I got this. But let's just say this encodes the spin of the electron. Okay. It's a polarization vector. Uh, where did I get the one and the I? You'll see. You'll see it crudely in a minute, and then you'll really see in a few weeks. Okay, so basically what I'm saying is this piece of the amplitude is proportional. Oh, an epsilon to E, zero, one, I, zero. Okay. Now, similarly, I want a polarization vector for this guy. Now, what can I do? I know that the muons are going to be scattered at some angle, right? So I'm just going to rotate this polarization vector in the XZ plane. So we have our second piece of the amplitude. Proportional to E, zero, cosine theta, I minus sine theta, right? Where epsilon mu here is just zero, cosine theta, I minus sine theta. And what did I do? I just rotated the, the, the same polarization vector, right? Because it's going to be at some angle. That's it. Using my usual rotations. That comes from that matrix, right? Rij, remember? The rotation matrix. Okay, cool. So now I have two pieces of the amplitude for this spin configuration. Now you all know from quantum mechanics, what does this even mean, this matrix element? Well, this is a matrix element. This is a matrix element, right? These two individual pieces. But now what does this combination mean? That's just taking an inner product, right? That's all that is. So now all I have to do now is take the inner product between this, sorry, between this and this, right? Between my two amplitudes, right? So does someone want to take the inner product and tell me what they get? Let me rewrite this really quick. So we're computing mu for RL to RL. We have that this bit is proportional to E zero. Sorry, this is cosine. And we have that this bit
proportional to E. Okay, and so I now want some, you know, final expression for this script M. So does someone, can someone take the inner product and tell me? Or the dot product? Ajay, you want to take this dot product with me? Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's work through it. Turn off the mic. Let's work through it. Let's work through it. I'm being serious. Come on. It's not that hard. We're going to work through it. We're going to work through it. Okay. Right, right. So what am I doing here? In quantum mechanics, if we have two four uh, two matrix elements like this, the mu's contract, right? So you've all seen this combination of four vectors, right? You've seen that, right, Ajay? This combination. This is just a dot product. So it's the same thing here. It's just the matrix elements. So what is the dot product? Well, I have to multiply and add each component. That's all, right? So let's do it. So the first part of the dot product or the inner product is I have to do E times E, right? What do I get when I do E times E? E squared. E squared. Zero times zero, matching up the zero. components, right? That's the definition of the dot product, right? Right, zero. so I get a zero plus what's cosine theta. E times one? Cosine theta. Yeah. I times I. Negative one. Right, minus sine theta times zero. Negative sine. Minus sine theta times zero. Oh, zero. Yeah. There we go. You did it. Okay, let me rearrange this a bit. I want to put it in this form. Okay. It's not hard. Don't be afraid. Come on in. Compute the dot product. You're going to have to do it a lot. It's very simple. Okay, and I get this guy. I just put the minus sign out and I just put it in the form I like it in. Okay. Okay, we got something for script M uh, using a very crude and kind of, kind of like insane argument, right? You just say, oh, you gotta have something, you know, close to E and uh, yeah, it's at some angle. <laughs> Turns out this is 90% accurate. Okay. So we got there, man. We don't even have to do field theory. We get 90% of the way there in like three lines of algebra and some arguments. Okay. What are we looking at? First of all, we're looking at the first order process, right? First order process. Okay. We haven't looked at second order, third. We haven't added up the other higher order terms in the perturbation series. Also, we have to look at different spin configurations, right? So let's do that. So it actually turns out that there are only a finite number of non-zero spin configurations. So mu RL to RL minus E squared one plus cosine theta. Okay, it turns out there are a finite number of non-zero spin configurations. And you can test this out. In other words, there are only a set number of spin configurations that give me some value that's not zero. Okay, so I'm gonna write down all of them. I wrote them down here because I'll forget them. Okay, so here are all my non-zero ones. And you should actually like play around with this just for fun. Okay, which gives us, when you plug back into the differential cross section, we get this guy. Okay, this will be when uh, I add up all of these amplitudes and put it into this formula. I'll tell you what alpha is in a second.
This gets us 90% of the way there to the right cross section, right? And it depends what angle you're scattering at, right? To tell you how much of something is there. Now, let's think about this. So actually what happens in an experiment, right? So all of these processes are what? They're all first order processes, right? Uh, in particle physics jargon, first order process, another way to say it is, these are all processes to tree level. So I'm gonna use that a lot. So just make sure you know, tree level just means first order. So these are all tree level processes, right? We haven't gone to higher order diagrams and we get to 90% of the way there. And these are all the different spin configurations because what happens in the lab, you don't actually see the muon spinning. <laughs> you know, that's not what people see in the lab, right? Uh, in the lab, they have a beam of muons. They have a beam of electrons. So they're taking actually the weighted average of all of these combinations, right? So actually one good exercise would be add up all of these and see if you get this, you won't get exactly this because there's another averaging procedure we have to learn, right? Because we need to average out these guys because in the lab, they're not going, oh, we just computed mu RL to mu RL or MRL to MRL. That's not how it works, right? In the lab, you have beams. So for the theory, from the theorist's perspective, we have to take that into account. Wonderful. So we use brute force. Now, I told you that each part of the Feynman diagram will contribute to a piece of the relativistic amplitude. I'm going to tell you what each piece is going to contribute. You're not going to know where I'm getting it from, what any of it means. I just want you to see. And we're going to write down the same amplitude. And it's going to look so different from this. But you'll see, we actually get the same result. And we'll see how we get that same result later on in the course, in like week four or five. So. Any questions before I give you the Feynman rules for QED? Okay. Oh, the Feynman diagram. Simplified field theory, so much. I sometimes wonder if we never had Feynman diagrams. It's not like we wouldn't learn field theory, we would, but it would just be much harder to compute. Okay, and so we learned that this guy is really proportional to mu, to m. I keep saying mu. <laughs> okay, let's let's write down the rules. Okay, we have our diagram. Charge. Uh, e plus. E minus E plus momentum. I'll write all of that down in a second. These are both going inbound. Uh, these are both going outbound. E minus E plus. Okay. By the way, this is one tree level diagram, right? And we're going to see we can have different tree level diagrams. Maybe I flip it this way or the other way. Okay. That, those will be different diagrams. Okay. Let's talk about it. First, let's write down a factor for the internal line. So each internal line in QED gets a factor of minus I. You're going to be like, what the heck? G mu nu, Minkowski metric over Q squared. So minus I, G mu nu over Q squared is the analog to this guy, to the photon piece. This is called the photon propagator. Okay, so each internal line gets a propagator. I just want you to know how to compute these amplitudes for now. You're not going to know what the heck is going on because we haven't derived any of it. We will. We will. That's one of the hardest parts of this course, actually, is deriving the rules. Once you do that, then you can almost work for any theory. It's not that hard. Okay. Each vertex, or the point where the interaction happens, is going to get a factor of minus i e gamma nu. This one will get minus i e gamma mu. Okay, what's gamma mu and nu? Let's talk. 
Okay, so minus I E gamma mu is the direct analog of what? Of the interaction Hamiltonian, right? That takes this bit, right? It's telling me the interaction strength. Gamma mu and gamma nu are going to be a set of four by four matrices. And they're going to be called the Dirac matrices. And basically all they'll do is input all the spin, stuff with spin, which we'll learn. We're gonna learn a lot of properties of the Dirac matrices. Okay, so that tells us about the interaction strength. And of course, I mean, the one thing you should note is it's got E, right? Which is good, should have E. <laughs> so we're there, we're still proportional with some kind of charge or whatever. And uh, yeah, this is called the interaction vertex or whatever factor. Okay, now I wanna label E minus and E plus and mu minus and mu plus. So we're going to label them in the following, u, v, u bar, and v bar. u corresponds to a particle going in, an ingoing particle. I'm gonna go very slow with this because I got really confused the first time. v corresponds to an ingoing antiparticle. u bar, corresponds to an outgoing particle. And V bar corresponds to, you guessed it, an outgoing antiparticle. So this is the direct analog of my uh, E plus E minus and my mu plus mu minus piece of the transition amplitudes. Okay, so now I'm just replacing each piece with the real Feynman rules. Okay, each one of these guys is gonna have a momentum, P, K, K prime, P prime. And each one of these is also gonna get an additional label, R or S. R or S will tell me about the spin of the particle. Okay, again, none of this means anything right now, but you'll see when you get there. Okay, so I will write mu plus, mu plus is an outgoing, antiparticle. So it's an antiparticle V. It's outgoing, so V bar. I'm going to give it the spin label S prime and it has momentum K prime. That's how we'll write these guys. Mu minus is an outgoing particle, so it gets U bar. Oh shoot, okay, sorry, 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 sorry. sorry. For antiparticles and particles, we, we put the bar or take off the bar based on the direction of charge flow. Very confusing, but you'll see why. So this is actually a V because the charge is ingoing. My mistake. This is an outgoing particle, so it's U bar. We'll give it the spin label S and we'll give it momentum K. This is an in outgoing antiparticle, right? Because the charge is outgoing. So we'll give it a V bar. We'll give it a spin label R prime and a momentum P prime. And this guy's an ingoing particle. So this will be U R of P. Okay, anyone confused? Literally, I've done no physics. I've just labeled things, right? I've done no physics at all. And uh, these rules are totally random on the face of it. But you will see how amazing these rules are and how actually manipulating this stuff gets you the same answer. And then you can compute any amplitude. Okay, these are really, I mean, this is just pretty much Feynman rules for QED. So QED, Feynman rules on the, on the right. This is, this is it, I'm being serious. Now, of course it gets way more complicated because to tree level, this is it. But higher order, you're gonna see loops and weird divergences and stuff. Okay. Awesome. Okay, let's write down the amplitude. You guys are actually going to write down a QED amplitude in your first quantum field theory class. Wow. I'm just, this is incredible. And you guys are going to help me, so. Okay, take a second and write down the amplitude on your, on your paper. Okay, give me an expression from you for this diagram to tree level. M, sorry, 
for this process. Okay. So, uh, you know, in the other argument, the heuristic argument, we had to keep track of spin with polarization vectors. Here, we don't have to do that because what we'll see is the gammas will take care of that and the spin labels. So, okay, write down an amplitude. Uh, I didn't tell you one nasty thing. That is actually the order of these guys really matters. But for now, just put them in any order you want. For fermions, we'll see that the order really matters. Okay, as you work through that, I'll write down mine. Don't look at my answer yet. See, see what you get. Just easy, you're just literally plugging in the pieces, that's it. It's, it's nothing complicated at all. Okay, that's my angle too. Now you might say, Kyle, this looks nothing like what we got with uh, just using the heuristic argument. And you're right, because there's a lot of trace rules we'll use and a lot of different techniques we'll use. And actually you'll end up seeing that it's really only a few lines of algebra to get from here to the same D sigma over D omega we got. So it's quite impressive actually. Wonderful. I will do one more quick manipulation to write it in a nicer form. You can work that out, uh, contracting these guys. And I, I, I worked it out. There's a bit of algebra here. So I e squared over Q squared. V bar, R prime, V prime, gamma mu. U R of P times uh, V of S prime K prime gamma lower mu U R S of K. Okay, so wor work out some of the you know multiplying factors and the metric and see if you can get the same expression with that factor out in front. Okay. So that's our, did, did you guys get something similar to this? I hope just plugging in everything. Yes, hopefully some more or less, or at least you see what I did. I just literally copied it. Okay, okay. No, no new physics at all. Okay, so let's conclude on this. Let's talk about some other processes. Uh, that we're going to uh, figure out in the future. Uh, what could be some other QED stuff? So by the way, people always say QED is the theory of light and matter. It's true. Who would have thought that light and matter interact? That's kind of incredible if you sit back and think about it, right? Photons are light. Photons are light, right? And at the most fundamental level, quantum electrodynamics governs the laws of electromagnetic interactions. It's describing the interaction of light and matter. You, you've all heard of like the photoelectric effect, all of that kind of stuff, right? So it's all kind of connected to one another. Okay, so another process could be E plus E minus 
to E plus C minus. Just two positrons and electrons scattering off each other. This is called Baba scatter, and you can look this stuff up. That's why I'm referencing it. We will, we will uh, compute amplitudes for this. The reason it's harder is that there are two tree level processes. So here are the two tree level diagrams. E plus, oh, sorry, E minus, E minus, E plus, E plus, and this is added to another tree level diagram where the uh, electron is sailing along, the uh, positron is sailing along, and they exchange a photon along the way. There are two tree level diagrams. Notice, what, how am I defining a tree level diagram versus a higher order diagram? This is the last thing I'll conclude on. I think I'm right. Yeah, I have, I have five minutes left. Okay, this is interesting. So you remember from quantum mechanics, you had some hard sphere scattering, right? You had the electron or some particle coming in, scattering and bouncing off. And I said, this is a tree level diagram. Why? Because it has one, two interaction points, right? And I said, to get the next order diagram, what do you do? All you do is add another interaction point, right? You go one order higher. It, it gets complicated by one order. So, so these are both tree level because I have two interaction points. In other words, when we look at the scattering amplitude, we have this thing called alpha. Right? Alpha is called the coupling constant or the strength of the coupling, or just the coupling. In d sigma d omega for uh, electron positron annihilation, which we just computed, we had some alpha squared. It was proportional to some alpha squared, right? That's good because it was at tree level. And at tree level, we had two interaction points, alpha squared. Okay, this is also to alpha squared in the coupling. So a lot of times you'll hear people say, oh, to alpha cubed in the coupling, the, the uh, amplitude looks like this. Well, alpha cubed corresponds to what? A second order interaction, three vertices. So this is also to alpha squared in the coupling. And it's more complicated because we have an extra diagram to think about that we don't have in uh, E plus E minus to mu plus mu minus. Now let's look at the diagrams for E plus E minus to mu plus mu minus to alpha cubed in the coupling, right? Let's look at the higher order diagrams. I actually drew all of them. I looked them up and drew all of them. So I'll draw them now. There are a finite number of diagrams to alpha cubed. Let's draw them. So here are all the diagrams, higher order diagrams, E plus E minus to mu plus mu minus to order alpha cubed in the coupling, right? So higher order. So you have something like this, where they uh, exchange each other, like they self annihilate. This is called a bubble diagram or a loop diagram. You might have something like this. So, you know, these are all added, right? in the perturbation series. You might have something like this, where a photon kind of randomly emits as the a particle moves. You may have something like this. Notice now I have more uh, vertices to think about. You may have something like this. This is called a box diagram. And we, these are higher order processes that have been observed. Okay. Plus five more. There are five other diagrams, which you can look up. You can see this process gets very uh, hard computationally, right? Because the minute I go to order alpha cubed, I need to compute nine diagrams. 
what you can do will take you probably eight or nine hours. Many researchers have done this. Nowadays, you put it into a computer and it just spits out the amplitude. No one really computes this stuff on paper. Uh, but to order alpha cube now, uh, these loops are going to be a lot of problems for us because these integrals, as we've seen before, diverge. And so a whole portion of our class will be how to get rid of those divergences. That will be a huge part of this course. Uh, someone made the joke that if the integrals never diverge, field theory would be a pretty short class. And they're pretty right. They're pretty right. I mean, if, if we had no divergences, uh, we would field theory would be far simpler, far simpler. Still hard, but far simpler. Okay, so, okay, excellent. So I have given you a brief survey. Next class, we will dive into quantizing a field for the first time. Uh, we will quantize a scalar field, which we've seen classical scalar fields with Klein-Gordon, and we're going to quantize it. And we're going to write down a Lagrangian for our theory. And we're also going to see how these raising and lowering operators now can correspond to the creation and annihilation of particles in our field theory. Uh, we're not going to have any interactions, so we're going to be working with what we call a vacuum field theory, just a free field theory, and we're going to play around with it. We're going to we're going to play some games with it. So that is the goal. Please read those chapters; they're very very essential, and uh, watch that lecture because that was awesome. You'll get a very nice overview of what this is about. Okay, folks, any questions before Johnson takes over? John, you guys are going to be so happy when you hear Johnson because you're going to understand everything with clarity and precision. So does anyone have any other questions before I sign off? I will be here tomorrow morning from 9 to 10 for my usual. No problem tomorrow, but just talking about whatever you want to talk about. Anyone have questions, though, before I sign off? Okay. Okay. Okay, I'll be I'll be around Johnson. I usually pop in and out, uh, but I don't. It depends depending on the day. So, All right, sounds good. All right, I'll just make you the holds just a second. All right. Uh, do you guys want a five minute break, or should we 